if I could take five minutes to explain to you how I came to the decision to support uh, advancing President Obama's trade agenda to the next stage. Um, President Obama has made the point that if we're going to increase uh, employment and wages for our middle class, one of the things we have to do is open up markets overseas so that we can sell stuff made in the United States to those markets that are emerging. And 95% of the world's population is out of here. 40% is covered by the, the Asian or the Pacific uh, countries covered by this trade agreement. And a lot of them are really uh, going to be strong future markets. In particular, Vietnam has lowered its poverty rate from 50% to 4% over the last decade. They're coming. Um, and President Obama observes that we don't want other countries to set the rules for the environment and for labor, for human rights. We want to be the ones setting those rules. And if we don't set those rules, it's probably going to be no one setting it or it's going to be China. So I think that was a good premise. The three things I was looking for in a trade deal, though, before I would support even moving it to the next stage. First, I didn't want another NAFTA. Uh, we know that NAFTA, 20 years ago or so, fell short of what it promised in terms of human rights and environmental quality. So I've looked very hard at what we're going to do to make sure that we, we you know, maybe don't repeat the same thing or at least learn from our mistakes to say it, say it positively. Um, and on this, on this um, score, I think the president is on the right track. On May 10th, 2007, Democrats who were in control of Congress at that time, not that long ago, um, passed a resolution that said that any future trade agreements would have to have certain basic um, labor and environmental standards. Labor standards had to do with the right to organize, the right of a minimal wage, no child labor, um, the kinds of things that we all take for granted here that aren't um, at play in some of our competitor countries. Uh, in terms of environment, observe the basic treaties. Fisheries, uh, wildlife protection, endangered species, uh, things that we accept, again, that not everyone in the world accepts. Uh, stop stealing our intellectual property. We don't want that ripped off. And, and impose some basic human rights uh, standards on these other countries. Now, we do that not just because it's the right thing to do for those people, which it is. We do that also because it's unfair for our workers to have to compete and bearing these costs against workers that don't have to carry those costs. In this agreement, I've seen the drafts. If they can do what President Obama is trying to do in Mexico and in Vietnam for labor, uh, it's really going to improve things for workers there. You would all say it's a game changer. Um, they're going to, uh, the, some of the environmental groups are really excited about what's going to happen if President Obama can pull this off for fisheries, stopping overfishing, for habitat protection, for, um, for stopping uh, illegal logging, and for telling places like Japan that you can't do shark finning and whale hunting. That's all going to be in here that's if, if we are successful. Uh, they're going to not be able to rip off our, um, our intellectual property, which is where we get a lot of our, our profit uh, locally, domestically, and they're going to impose basic human rights standards. So on that score, I've um, had every briefing. I've had the ability to look at the, at the text. I'm confident that President Obama's on the right track. Second thing was I needed something that's enforceable because as good as a piece of paper is, um, as good as the words are on it, and as comforting as they may be, unless we can enforce that, uh, it's nearly not worth much more than the paper it's written on. So there's two aspects of enforcement. Everyone is comfortable with the state-to-state -state enforcement regime where one country sues another country if they don't meet the objectives or the requirements. Um, and that's typically what would happen. So uh, today if we have a trade agreement with another country and they're doing something that's anti-trade or against the agreement, the United States Trade Representative initiates an action against that country in the international courts. It's handled and people are very comfortable with that. Uh, there's, for investor, uh, the investor chapter, there's something else called ISDS. And you may have heard about this. This is what's caused a lot of heartburn. In fact, there are agreements. Uh, no one has ever successfully won a case against the United States law. Um, and so I think that is of some comfort. In fact, the courts here are so good that uh, people who litigate on our trade agreements don't even choose to go to ISDS. They go to the United States courts because not only can they get a damages award, but they can get a law thrown out. And this is something with which we are all very comfortable. We uh, believe in the right of courts to invalidate bad laws. The most recent example, the one I like to cite, is remember when Escondido, the city of Escondido, passed a law 
that landlords had to check the papers of, of uh, tenants who looked like they might be Mexican, right? And, and undocumented. We were happy that someone could sue Escondido on what they said was a health and safety law and get it thrown out as unconstitutional, and Escondido had to pay damages for that because they'd exceeded our authority. So that, that's something we're, we're comfortable with. The U.S. courts deal with that fairly well, and sometimes you do want a law thrown out. Uh, the, the, the closer question is what happens when a multinational corporation sues another government um, to overturn a law. And there's two examples that have come up. One was a case in Canada where a, a, a permit to mine was denied by a local government. There was a lawsuit, and although I don't think it reached the resolution, there was enough pressure on the government to change its mind and issue the permit. And I looked at that case a lot because that's the kind of thing we would be worried about. On the other hand, you know, I, I recognize that this is the kind of thing that happens in the United States. If you tell, if I was on the city council, I told the developer, you have a piece of property, it's permitted for, for some house, but I'm never going to permit a house there. They can sue me and get damages because I'm not behaving correctly. And there was at least some suggestion that that's maybe what happened in Canada. Not 100% sure about that. The one, the one, uh, um, uh, the, the cigarette labeling case in Australia was another one. Under a different agreement that wasn't, the United States wasn't a party to, it was a Hong Kong-Australia agreement. Someone sued Australia because they tried to label cigarettes in a very restrictive way, and someone said that was anti-trade. Um, those are the two cases I found that have created some concern by which these things will be judged. And President Obama's um, idea is to put American legal standards into these governing documents. And although I wasn't 100% sure that, that, this was, um, that this was foolproof, I think any, you know, look, the Supreme Court is not foolproof, right? Uh, I think any judicial body is not going to be foolproof. I, I wanted you to think about that for a minute. <laughs> uh, I'm comfortable enough that the effort is to put good laws in place that would govern trade in a way that's fair. The final thing is transparency. And there's two aspects to this. One is, President Obama's folks, his, his negotiators say, we have to keep things confidential because we don't want to give away our negotiating position. And, of course, you recognize that that's true. You're trying to buy a house. You're not going to tell the seller what your top price is, right? You have to keep that confidential. Um, on the other hand, I do think the president could have been much more forthcoming on this, on this side of it because um, members of Congress were the only, are, the, are the only people who have been able to look at the actual text. I don't think it's so bad for me or for some of these lawyers up here to be able to read through that, but a lot of members of Congress really needed their staff to look at it, and that was, a, that was prohibited. And so for those folks, I think we should have opened the tent a little bit more so that they could get a better look at it. But I looked at every page that I wanted. They would bring it to my office. We would talk about the issues. Then my staff would leave the room, and they would unlock and unzip this pouch, and I would get to read the document. So it was satisfactory for me. It should have been a more open process. But the good news is that once President Obama goes, negotiates his deal and brings it back to us, it's going to be available to all of you and everybody on the Internet for 60 days before he can even sign it, let alone bring it to Congress. So this is unprecedented. You will have access to every word in that document. And here's what I'll tell you about TPP. If it doesn't meet the objectives that he said he's going to meet, I'll vote against it. And I think Susan Davis would say the same thing if she were here. I know she shares this territory with me. Um, so people say, well, you won't be able to make amendments to it. And I, I, that's true. You won't be able to make amendments to it. That is, to me, a good reason for Duncan Hunter to vote against this, but not for me. And why is that? The negotiator is President Barack Obama, and the Congress is led by Mitch McConnell and John Boehner. I'm not the one who's going to be making amendments to President Obama's tr uh, trade deal, okay? So I like the idea of him being negotiator. I like, I've seen what, you know, when they talk about climate change, when they talk about immigration, the kinds of stuff they throw at, at these things from the Republican side. I don't want to miss it up. So we will have an up and down vote. It will come sometime at the end of the year. But probably this thing will be fully in front of us. and You can read every word of it. And then we really will see, first of all, if you agree with me on the drafts that I've seen, but I'll also see, did he deliver on these things that he said he could get from Vietnam, from Mexico, uh, from Malaysia to make things fairer for our workers uh, to be able to sell stuff overseas?
So I don't expect everyone to agree with me. I know this has been a hotly debated thing. It is split Democrats. Um, on the other hand, I, I think it's a rational position. Um, and um, I just wanted you to hear it from me because a lot of you worked really hard to get me reelected. Uh, elected and reelected, and I think you deserve that from me. But do you have time for a couple questions? A couple questions? Sir? How does this protect the uh, workers of the United States? How does it protect the workers of the United States? Today, the workers of the United States have to compete. Well, first of all, Today, there's tariffs for American goods to be sold overseas that don't exist for overseas goods to be sold here. So that's really unfair. It's also unfair that American workers, we pay a minimum wage, we, we give sick days, we give overtime, we abide by environmental laws that put costs on companies and those goods have to bear that cost. They, these workers producing stuff here are competing against workers overseas that don't have those uh, restrictions. So by imposing these restrictions overseas, we level the playing field for our workers so they're not, they're not competing against unfair competition. And to the extent we open markets for stuff sold here to be sold overseas, to made here to be sold overseas, that creates more jobs and higher wages for workers here. There's a question. Oh, sir. Sure. Sir? Sure. Right. Sure. Congressman Peters, uh, thank you for that explanation about the TPP. But I don't understand, though, is if, you, if it had the safeguards, the environmental safeguards, and for labor, and, and we don't get to read it, but those folks studied it much more than I did, how come major environmental organizations and much of all of labor was against the TPP uh, for, the, for the issues right. that you just talked about? It's a fair question. I had that same question. So first of all, um, what we voted on was called Trade Promotion Authority. We haven't voted yet on TPP. Um, and I think a lot of the confusion was, was that, but I looked really hard at that. Um, first of all, I think that labor's position is that every trade deal is NAFTA. It just can't be better than that. And I, I, I was unwilling to say that President Obama couldn't do better than that. We should cut him off and not let us even bring something to vote on. So um, and the other thing is I saw the, the drafting strategy and the negotiating strategy, and I, it brought me a lot of comfort that you know, President Obama is the person who saved the auto industry. He's done universal health care. He enacted Dodd-Frank. He's been a bigger climate champion than any president we've ever had. He shares the values that we would want uh, of someone who would negotiate this. And so I think he should be given the chance. But, but I think they're very mistrustful of any trade deal. On the environmental side, there is a little bit of a split. Um, some environmental groups are very happy with what they're seeing from their perspective. So Oceana the Nature Conservancy, uh, the World Wildlife Fund. They're excited about what's going to be happening for fisheries and habitat, illegal logging, those kinds of things. The Sierra Club's raised a, a concern I've looked very deeply at, at about, um, about natural gas. And I think that they think that uh, more trade means more natural gas means more fossil fuels. Um, I think that the way we deal with climate is not in this agreement. I think we have to uh, we have to commit to an energy strategy that uh, deals with, uh, well, first replaces coal, make sure that the extraction of, of natural gas is without fugitive methane emissions, and then is not a long bridge, but a very short bridge to a truly renewable energy system. I don't think that's part of this agreement. So uh, we'll see when the, when the thing comes back if, if their fears are, are taken care of or if their fears are legitimate, and I think we can vote accordingly on the deal itself.